puts out, I guess the next step is IETF last call. So that's the on. third of those documents that uh, we've reached the milestone, but we don't have an RFC. All right, now the two, two unachieved milestones that we have, one is for NVMe for PNFS. Uh, the target, the current target date is August 2020. Right now, we don't have a working group document. The target date has to be considered tentative. We may need to discuss a possible new target. Target. We'll be hearing about that 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 work uh, from Soren uh, on the 29th. All right. The other thing that we'll be hearing about today is uh, RPC RDMA version two, when there are two do associated documents. That's targeted at December 2020. That seems, seems to be on track. I'm assuming that the current I'm assuming that the current version scope is appropriate, and I think maybe maybe we'll discuss that when uh, when uh, Chuck has 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 his talk. Now I have a set of three documents where we don't have milestones, but we agree that there will be milestones. And uh, one of those is internationalization. That, that's to be a document that deals with internationalization for all of NFS before. I first submitted, uh, submitted an ID on the 14th of, of December and submitted the 01 recently. And we'll we'll have to work toward promoting that to be a working group document. And I think we should decide on the target date for that soon, but I really can't figure out what we need to do in terms of review. I'll talk about that later. What we need in terms of review to make that appropriate to move to working group status. Then we have security, which is a big job. I'll discuss about that later. And I think we should decide on a target date by the by the end of May. Um, and finally, we have RFC 5661 BIS, and uh, the, the, I'm, I'm before I start and work on that, I have to work until I have RFC 5661 SESQUI to use the base, and I don't know when that'll, I figure that'll, that's not happening now, might be a month, and we'll just see what it is, and once that's out, we'll just discuss, I'll decide on the target date, and we'll speak to uh, Magnus about that. So that's the end of that. So uh, now we'll move on to the next person. All right, so that is uh, the next item on, on the agenda is Tom Haynes, who will be talking about draft ITF NFC before Dell's did. I'll, I'll get his slides up in a, uh, in a second. Okay, Tom. Yeah, you're all yours. Okay, so um, how does it advance? Do I just click it, or you'll click it? Well, I think the easiest you could you could you could do you could uh, have your your screen, but I think given the trouble trouble we've had, it's easier if, if I do it. All right. Um. So a quick agenda: what we missed in IETF 105. Where am I currently at? And the, the most important question, what does it take to have this go forward? Um, so in IETF 105, I had a 60 seconds at the end of the meeting to present my slides, and we were being pushed out by the next uh, working group. So I'll cover the slides I didn't get to present and then go on from there. Can we advance, please? 
Okay, sure. David, can you ma uh, can you maximize that window? I'll bring it into full screen mode even. And no. All right, this is this is it. Okay. Um so since the, the on the last draft, what we introduced was a new uh, operator called layup WCC. And what this is intended to do is like the read and writes out of uh, V3, we want to maintain weak cache consistency um, to avoid round trips to the DSs uh, to, to update the, um, the size M time and A time. And this is a uh, advisory piece of functionality in the sense that the uh, the MDS can determine whether or not to use the uh, WCC data or not. Um, next screen, please. So. Um, Second, what I'm trying to show here is uh, the sequence of events where we open the file, we uh, get the device info, we write the file, we return the layout, and when we return the layout, the, um, the, the MDS in green has to go to the DS and say, hey, what are the current set of attributes? Um, because the the MDS has no notion of whether or not the file has been modified. Re remember, the the only control protocol uh, for the back end is NFS v3. So it does does this operation, and what we contend is this operation is expensive because the client already has um, from the right gotten this information from its weak cache consistency model. And it could send it to uh, the DS. Can we advance, please? Okay. So uh, I, I just actually went over this. My, I guess my slides are redundant. We we just got the data. We we can only we can use the layout WCC to send that information on. Advance, please. Uh, advance one more time, please. Okay. We're on the next one, please. So the, the right has the reply, and now we've added a new operation uh, in the the compound where we hit, we set in layout WCC and then the layout return. Next slide, please. Sure. So we, we looked at several operations. Um, a layout return modification that meant we had to spin up a new version of the flex files type. Uh, the layout commit, um, but the layout commit actually has strong cache consistency, not weak, and it has additional semantics that we don't want. So, you know, basically, we looked at RFC 1813, yanked out the WCC, and presented it here. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So this catches us up with what we had at 105. Um, the first version had everything but the, the layout we cache consistency. We agreed to make it a work, working group item, and I never finished off the review items. Okay. Um, I've gotten, since this, this slide was written originally, 
I've gotten an additional review from David uh, and I haven't looked at it because I'm, I'm, well, next slide and I'll try and explain it there. So we, we've got an implementation of almost everything. Um, we have this, and we found that the time skew is a killer. And what I mean by this is when we, when, uh, so th this goes back to the, when we delegate the, the M time and the C time, or the M time and the A time to the client that has the delegation, and it caches locally those times, hands them out to the application. And what happens is when we return those times back to the MDS, um, time skew is really kind of uh, in your face. You have to determine whether the time given back by the client, how does it compare to your clock? Um, and regardless of how it compares to your clock, you're basically bounded by the fact that it can't be in the future. And you're most likely going to say, you know what, I'm just going to use the now time that's on the, on the MDS. So you, you end up touching the, the M time uh, for the file. And this is, is um, problematic in the sense of you have uh, code like F test or um, XFS tests or any of these um, utilities that try to do POSIX compliance, the ones, the, the, the really simple ones, they, they do a file, they create a file, they, they make some test that's going to do something for POSIX compliance, and then they sleep for a second, and then they take a stat, and then they assert whether or not something's changed. Well, with delegation caching, it doesn't change. What happens, though, is if you have some application that must have the same M time or must have, well, actually it must have the same M time from uh, start to finish, it's going to eventually discover that the M time has changed from underneath it. Uh, so that's the biggest killer of, um, is that acceptable or not to your application? need to add some verbiage to talk about that. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what's, what's holding us up is um, I don't like the model where we get the spec done, we um, go implement the code in two different code bases, uh, you know, usually a proprietary server base, and then the Linux client and then we have implementation issues and we can't go rev the spec. We did that with, um, with the first flex files. We did it with the uh, security model. Um, get the uh, name of it right now where we, we push stuff into the Linux client that wasn't compatible with the spec. So we had to go change the spec. Luckily we could do it at the time. So I want to get, I want to have the model where we get the spec mostly done, we implement the code, and then we go fix the spec up so it's working to match the code base. And I'm hung up on, personally, on implementing the weak cache consistency model. Uh, it's me again. So I need to go get that done so that I can go feed back into a, a, a new draft of the, the document, which I can then start accepting uh, review comments on. I uh, question. Yeah, that's it. Go ahead. Uh, I, I know, I know what you're talking about, but when do you anticipate? Um, going every month I anticipate working on it. So, um, let's let's set some dates for me to feel pressure from. All right, up to you. I'm not going to put pressure on you. No, I mean, I'll put pressure, pressure on, on myself. Uh, 
if it's I have something to shoot for. So, so personally, my model is I, I tend to work on this stuff on the plane out to the meeting. And then during the week of the meeting, when I only have this meeting, I work on it and get a lot done. And I'm, I'm going to blame COVID-19. So. Yeah. All right, um, I'll, I'll give you some times by the next meeting. Okay, um, sure. Can I ask a quick question about your previous slide? Sure. Um, I, I think what you're saying is that the M time can never be what the client expects, yes? I mean, even if you had a time sync protocol or something like that, that the protocol as designed will always deposit a different M time. Did I hear that right? Well, there's there's two models to it. You, you, the answer, well, I'm sorry. One, you're right. Two, we could take the stance that whatever the client gives us is what we record. Yeah. Even if it is in the future. Because this attempts to be POSIX compliant, I think that should maybe be the guide. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I agree actually, because, I, and I think that's why I put this slide here because it was bugging me. Okay, well, obviously discussion is required. I was just trying to get to whether you're arguing that this is inherent in the current protocol design, or if it's something that we just didn't think hard about. You know what, I, I, I actually think it's not inherent in the design. I think it's inherent in the implementation details. And maybe what we need to do is draw it out of the implementation details and put it into the... Good, I mean, the second thing you describe, how two interoperable implementations before finalizing the protocol, that's standard operating procedure for the ITF, so that's easy to agree on. But it doesn't seem to be my experience. Well, yeah, jumping the gun is a problem, but that's perhaps not following the procedure. So, you know, yeah. I, I mean, we're totally in agreement. I just wanted to point that out. No, I, I'm, I'm actually happy you, you asked the questions because it's drawn out my objection to my document. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Next up is Chuck in talking about integrity measurement. Let me uh, get those slides up. Are you sure it's impossible for me to share my screen? That seems like that would make these no, presentations go faster. Go ahead and do share it. Share it. I could. I can give it to you. Hold on. I think. Hold on, Chuck. Yeah, pass the bolt. I'm trying. Hello. Try it, Chuck. All right. Okay. Chuck. Can you see it? Yep. Perfect. Yep. All right. I'm going to, everyone hear me okay? I can ask uh, answer about everyone, but I can. Yeah, good. I hear you perfectly, Chuck. Okay. Uh, purpose of this work, uh, I'm just reminding folks uh, what we are doing with this. Uh, there's a uh, a Linux implementation of a file integrity uh, measurement architecture, and we would like to be able to um, store this uh, integrity measurement metadata on NFS servers um, using uh, either a standard extension to NFS. Uh, is there a question? Okay. Uh, or or a, a sidecar that a sidecar RPC pro protocol um, that is also standardized so that uh, um, non-Linux uh, implementations can be completed. Um, so I, I was attempting to write all this stuff down in documents and move it through the ITF process. And um, we hit a stumbling block last fall after IETF 105. Um, the original document was um, this uh, IETF NFS V4 integrity measurement. Um, this is now a working group document um, that 
uh, describes the uh, protocol extensions for exchanging the metadata, but it treats the, the metadata itself as opaque. Um, so there was uh, um, some objections from Craig Everhart and Spencer Scheffler uh, that um, you know if the if the metadata format isn't described somewhere, then uh, broad implementation that is non Linux implementations uh, would be difficult to produce. Um, there was also a hint at a legal issue, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, so at that point, progress on this document was essentially stopped. Um, and the request, as I understand it, was uh, for a, a metadata format specification to be provided, um, maybe in this document or maybe in another. Um, my choice was in another document, and we'll get to that in a minute. So as I started working on the metadata format document, we uh, realized that there were some legal challenges uh, because um, this uh, was only uh, there's only a code implementation. There is no specification that we could find anywhere. Um, there, there's some online documentation in the form of wikis and whatnot, but there really is no uh, specification. Um, the code itself is under GPLv2, um, and that that uh, kind of uh, eliminates the opportunity for us to contribute it directly to the ITF. So we had some alternatives. Um, we could work with the Linux Foundation to uh, identify the, the uh, original code contributors and, and request their permission to relicense the um, contributed code um, under GPL and BSD instead of just GPL v2 only. Um, and then that would that should enable us to contribute the format specification to the ITF. Um, the, the other two bullets on here are really, um, I guess, nonsense. I mean, this is kind of the only alternative that makes sense, uh, unless someone else uh, has an idea here. Well, I don't want to make it a suggestion, but defining a new on the wire metadata format that can be translated locally on the server or client to a native format certainly has precedent. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that under advisement. Thank you. Okay. I'm just uh, taking to making a note of that. So I'll be a second here. So that would be something like NFSV4 ACL. Oh, I don't want to paint it with that brush. Well, I, I'm just, yeah, it's a abstract. Yes, uh, you know, yeah. a, a neutral format, which is nonetheless translatable to the known local formats. Yeah. Okay. All right. I've captured that. Thank you. So this slide kind of describes uh, what the format requirements are. So if we were to create a new neutral format, um, it would it would uh, have to adhere to these uh, requirements. Um, it would have to be extensible. Um, it would carry uh, a signed checksum. Um, and uh, the checksum would be the hash would be computed uh, via a, a standard uh, hash algorithm like uh, SHA-256. Um, so I don't think that uh, that's I, I, that, that sounds feasible. A, a, a neutral a neutral format sounds feasible uh, based on these requirements. I think it, it wouldn't be difficult to do, and it would certainly get around uh, our legal issues. Um, so currently. I just want to describe the legal status really quick um, of the current effort. Um, 
I am working with a, a lawyer uh, at Oracle um, who is in contact with the Linux Foundation. Um, there's already plenty of uh, Linux kernel code that is under dual license. Um, uh, Mr. Talby, you are aware of probably a lot of that or an author of it, um, for example, in the RDMA stack. Um, so that's that's not out of the realm of possibilities. Um, all of the authors that we've been identify uh, be able to that we have been able to identify are still active contributors, um, and um, I've been in touch with most of them. Um, no one has objected to this process. Uh, none of them. None of the authors have objected to the process. Um, so that that process is ongoing, and uh, but unfortunately, it's kind of um, it doesn't have a determined uh, endpoint. We're still just working on it and seeing where it goes. So I do have a metadata format document that I can't share because sharing it would effectively be a, a, a contribution to the ITF and that would put that contribution under um, the ITF uh, code components license, which we cannot do. We don't have permission to do that yet. But the document exists and I can provide I can send copies to people who are interested in looking it over. Um, it just uh, it just has to remain private at this point. Um, and I'm not sure if people can see the bottom of this slide. Um, the current implementation status is I've got a prototype in Linux. It's it's out of date with the with the the uh, um, it's out of date in the sense that. The kernel has moved on. It's an old prototype, uh, or it's based on an old kernel, an older kernel. Uh, and um, I've had some conversations with the with the the folks who are actively working on the uh, Linux IMA implementation, and we think that for remote file systems, we will need to have um, um, internal Merkle trees on the clients uh, so that they can efficiently manage uh, changes to small parts of files, large files, uh, like uh, um, object code reposit or archives or things like that, um, where there would be changes in, in small parts of files and, and we really don't want to you know, break the entire uh, um, checksum just because of a, a change right in the middle of a large file. So. Um, People might recall that there was a proposal to use FS Verity, which is a, a Linux um, uh, file system based integrity um, mechanism. We can use some of that infrastructure. Ted Cho uh, proposed that on the NFS v4 list. Um, there are reasons why it wasn't practical, um, merely because he was storing the Merkle tree uh, past the end of the actual data in the file and extending the on disk format, we really can't do that in NFS. Um, but we could store, say, a signed root of a Merkle tree, um, and that would be enough for the client to um, reconstruct uh, the Merkle tree when it loads a file into memory. Um, and that would make things um, more secure and more efficient. So that's where we are. Are there any questions? I would like to get access to the draft, please. You can, I mean, I want to understand in more detail. Okay. So it sends to my, uh, you know, my email, not to the NFS. Got in here. So okay. How large is a typical Merkle tree for a file and percentage? I, I missed the beginning of your question. How big is a typical Merkle tree for a file based on the percentage of the size of the file? I, I, I don't have a ready answer to that. Um, it's significantly smaller than the file content. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're talking about, you know, tens of gigabytes of file content, you know, a Merkle tree might be one or two megabytes. Yeah. It's like a list of segments and hash calculations for the segments, that kind of thing. Yeah, we would basically do it on a page basis. Yeah. Kind of like a layout. I mean, 
it's isn't it the configuration point to saying how big segments you do sign in the Merkle tree, oh, and that affects the overhead. I know it all depends. I just I use the word typical, hoping that I could ignore all that, but it, it's fine. I'll go do some research. Yeah. So the design that they're looking at right now is that each each page in the um, in the page cache on the client would get its own hash. And then the Merkle tree would be constructed of uh, hashes of each page in the file. So, and then the page size in the machine uh, is probably um, 4K, and that would that would be a fixed. Exactly. Then a then a machine dependent parameter becomes a protocol requirement. So right. that can get tricky, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, this is Brian Pulowski. Quick question, who is JS that's logged in? They're on mute. Mysterious, but never mind. Back to you, Dave. Well, I think we're still with the uh... Chuck's doing uh, something. Jeff's ne next. Uh, next. Uh... Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Um. So this is a sort of a an overview of RPC over RDMA version two. I know that uh, this is not an interesting topic to a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of detail in this. We can drill into the detail, uh, or we could get to the interesting questions. I'm not sure what those are, so I'm looking for some feedback um, from the audience. What are you most interested in hearing about here? Oh, Almost started. nothing. Go ahead. I'm interested in everything, but that's just me. Okay. No, no, me too, because uh, it might have some contention to my draft related to uh, NVMe uh, over public. So I, I'm interested at least to. Okay. Sure so, there's no uh, contention. I mean, or, or I can refer this one in my document. So what I'll do is I'll just plow ahead, and uh, if there are points where people say, "Please uh, skip to the next, skip to the end," to, to quote the Prince's Bride, um, I can do that. Um, so there are several documents in question here. Um, the, the two most interesting ones, or the the ones that are being uh, worked on uh, at the moment, are the RPC RDMA version 2 document, which defines the new version of the protocol. Um, that's a working group document, and we do have a, a milestone, as Dave mentioned before. Um, this, the other document is uh, um, a new upper layer binding that would apply to uh, version 2, RPC over RDMA version 2, and uh, the NFS protocols. Um, so RPC over RDMA version two manages to fold in um, the work of two previous documents. Uh, one is RFC 8167, which defines uh, back channel operation um, uh, for uh, RDMA transports. And the other one is uh, the capability probing mechanism that's um, right now in the RFC, RFC editor queue. Um, CM private data will apply only to RPC over RDMA version one because we've folded that mechanism into um, uh, RPC over RDMA version two as a part of the of the protocol itself, and so um, we won't be doing capability probing using uh, the private data connection manager private data. Um, so one of the first motivations for version two is uh, to address some of the performance shortcomings of RPC over RDMA version one. Um, the default inline threshold for version one was uh, a kilobyte. Uh, that's obviously too small for some of the uh, 
um, NFS v4 operations like open, get at, or look up that might include uh, significant amounts of data. Um, for example, if you have a get at or in an open compound, it might be requesting things like um, security labels or ACLs or things like that. Um, so uh, we really needed to address the ability to manage these uh, smaller, uh, smaller exchanges that don't in involve uh, explicit RDMA operations like read and write. Um, we also wanted to be able to add in the ability to extend the, the transport protocol as we recognize new limitations or, or, or want to fix problems in the protocol for the same reason we have minor versioning in NFS. We wanted to have a certain amount of extensibility um, to, this, to this transport protocol as well. Um, one of the limitations to uh, RPC of RDMA version one was the was the hard need for um, reply size estimation on the on the, uh, clients on requesters. Uh, this is due to the fact that the requester is is required to provision uh, write and reply resources before the responder even has the the, re the request in hand. Um, the uh, requester has to figure out exactly how large the reply possibly could be, and then um, provision those resources. Um, there are plenty of corner cases in upper layer protocols where that is difficult or even impossible to do. Um, so we've added some mechanisms in RPC over RDMA version two that um, reduce or eliminate the need for reply size estimation. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a new upper layer binding version that is particularly for uh, NFS uh, or for NFS on RPC over RDMA version two. Um, and as I mentioned, reply size estimation requirements are, are considerably uh, relaxed or eliminated in this in this version of RPC over RDMA. And so we can change the language there, at least in the upper layer binding. Um, as we're working on um, RPC on TLS, we realized that we would need to have some peer authentication uh, mechanisms built into the RPC over RDMA transport. And so um, last year we decided to add that ability to uh, RPC over RDMA version two. Uh, since that uh, RPC on TLS doesn't actually have a, uh, we can't implement that on uh, RPC over RDMA on RPC, uh, can't put those two together directly. So. We're adding peer authentication into the. Uh, Chuck, when you're talking about peer authentication, you're talking about between uh, different clients or client and server? Client and server. Because I thought it's in, in the uh, NVMe case, it would be between two. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a an eye chart, but you know, I wanted to show. Uh, I, the, the differences in the way the XDR is defined between version one and version two. Dave did most of this work. He can maybe add some color to this uh, if people have uh, more detailed questions. But the idea here is basically we want to be able to allow um, authors to write new XDR definitions that can be combined uh, with RPC over already made version two, the base protocol, and then people can just um, suck these definitions out of the documents mechanically and, and concatenate them and, and get a working XDR definition for the combined um, protocol. Uh, I can go into a little more detail here, but, you know. Okay. Um, I mentioned before that we have uh, uh, the new ability to exchange transport characteristics. Like what we used to call transport characteristics are now called transport properties. Um, basically, at the uh, beginning of a connection before uh, RPC traffic is, is exchanged, um, there's a transport property exchange that um, carries the capabilities of both peers um, so that they can sort of understand the limitations on both sides. Um, host authentication, peer authentication, that's at the bottom of this uh, table. 
is uh, is one of those things that's exchanged. So it's an opaque. Um, we can put a, a potentially large certificate uh, or other uh, authentication material into this and uh, have that exchanged um, at, when a connection is, is uh, initiated. One of my pet projects um, for this version of RPC of RDMA is to uh, enable support for uh, asymmetrical operation, and that is um, any kind of exchange of message where um, there isn't exactly one response. So a requester might uh, send, a, 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 say, uh, a call and um, it doesn't have a reply. There, that's not really part of the NFS family of protocols, but some RPC protocols do that. Um, another case is where uh, a retransmission is necess necessary. Um, that screws up uh, version one credit counting. Um, and um, probably the most important and interesting example is the ability to send multiple uh, messages and get one response. And that would be, um, needed to support uh, message chaining. That is a call that's larger than one RDMA send uh, could be sent in multiple sends. Um, the receiver would, would con con concatenate those messages together and, and uh, reconstitute the call. This is done on the server, right? It, it goes both ways. Both ways. Yeah. yeah, this is interesting. I, I will mention though, historically, uh, retries were not expected because RDMA provides a reliable transport. Well, retries, yes, agreed. Um, retries are sometimes needed because servers are not responding. That's a server bug, not a protocol matter, I think, but yes. Agreed. Um, unfortunately, bugs are a reality, and uh, the behavior of most implementations is that the 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 stack deadlocks when the server doesn't respond. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of a problem. I would rather, instead of a server not responding at all, I would rather have a, a, a positive assertion from the server that, hey, I lost this. Um, I think that would be a, a lot better than dropping a connection or just dropping a request. But, you know, that, that Those should are all valid, that. But I think they have implications outside of RPC RDMA. So. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, message continuation is is a kind of a big deal. It's the ability, as I mentioned before, to construct a, a series of of RDMA sends that convey a single large uh, RDMA or a large RPC um, message. Um, so we have a very simple way of doing that. We've got a, a flags field in RDMA in the RDMA transport header now, and and just said a bit that says there's more to come with this with this message. Um, the this, this slide summarizes it. People can uh, look at, look into this further if they want to, and I'll just move on. Um, Those will be a change in a sense that they will be sent in one sequence or be multiple sequences. There it. You know, like with TCP, there's a there's a sequence of operations that happen on the, you know, one at a time on a transport. Um, so, uh, an RDMA QP is a is a in order and a reliable transport, and so you get a, a sequence of RDMA sends that are not interleaved with other RPC calls or RPC over RDMA messages. That's how that would work, and then it, it should be. Very straightforward for a receiver to um, reassemble the RPC call or the RPC message from uh, the set of, of uh, received uh, RDMA sends. I guess it does bear mentioning that um, credit exhaustion uh, can occur on a receiver uh, in the middle of a sequence, like an extended sequence of continued messages. Um, and we have we have added a provision to the to the RPC over an EMA um, transport version to uh, a protocol to uh, deal with that situation. I think 
I might mention that in a later slide, but if not, I can go over that. Um, there are still some open issues. Um, I, as I've been um, improving the Linux NFS server implementation, I noticed some, some issues around uh, dealing with uh, parsing read chunks. Um, and maybe maybe Tom can help me with these a little bit. Um, yeah, don't get me started on position zero read chunks, but yes, okay, go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'd kind of like, you know, it, in the other direction, uh, you know, we've got a reply chunk, which is, a, you know, basically that's the sort of converse of a position zero read chunk. And uh, the it a reply chunk is significantly less ambiguous than a positions or a read chunk is, and one of the things I've been sort of fantasizing about is actually getting rid of positions or of read chunks. And yeah, right. So for the for the uninitiated, the um, position zero read chunk is intended to provide a way for very large requests to be transmitted to the server, and basically it sends an empty request with a pointer to the request that the server then fetches via read. Reply chunk is, like Chuck mentions, kind of the opposite. Provides a buffer that the server can opportunistically RDMA write into. And they're both really awkward. They were designed for compatibility with corner cases in the protocol. I would love to see them go away. I suspect that to make them go away, we may have to infect the upper layer protocol slightly. So we may want to proceed with care. Right. I haven't. I haven't seen uh, vectors for that infection, uh, but I will. I will certainly heed your warning. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, this this slide mentions a couple of corner cases that are kind of interesting. Um, with the with the current uh, read chunk formats, we can have gaps in the RPC message. Uh, if I guess that would be a bug in the. Uh, the requester, um, but there's no, you know, I'm sure servers aren't prepared to deal with gaps, if broken clients, that is. Um, and I feel like- yeah, I don't think we need to design the protocol to be robust in the face of a broken implementation. But yeah, but it feels like we want to have uh, server implementers, uh, an increased amount of awareness among server implementers that this this is a possible bug and it could be abused by a malicious okay. client. I think that's okay, the job uh, of the internet draft author, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Dave? I think the issue we have we need here is, to address here is the the spec seem seems to need to say that this is misbehavior. And yeah. some of the cases you talked about in V1 it doesn't do that. And the third bullet is similar. Um, it's certainly possible to construct a, a read list that contains overlapping read chunks. And so maybe we want to have some explicit response from a server that says, you know, this is bad, don't do it. Yeah, that would be really awkward. So I'm going to blame all omissions on RPC RDMA maybe one on my co-author, Brent Callahan, who's not here. <laughs> okay. Agreed to. Anyway, those those are some things I noticed while hacking away on the on the version one implementation in Linux. Um, let's see, what does this slide say? Okay, I think we need to make some explicit statements in the version two document about some of these issues. Yeah, this is good, especially remote invalidation, which is tricky. It's sort of an opportunistic behavior and not a required behavior. Yeah. Well, let's just say for the first two bullets, um, I think that we should explicitly restrict uh, remote invalidation to uh, message and no message type messages and that yeah, already made two errors should not be allowed to use send with inval invalidate. Okay. Uh, last slide. Um, 
more review, always helpful. Um, I encourage it strongly uh, for my documents and for everybody else's. Um, I'm certainly lax uh, in that regard. Um, so review, 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 review. Um, I haven't done any prototyping of version two stuff yet. Is save uh, the remote and validation work I've done in version one that drove the CM private data document. Um, I am beginning to have this conversation internally um, with uh, the folks I work with to see if I can get some interest in them actually stepping up and writing some either uh, private uh, prototypes that we can experiment with this or or um, some stuff that we can actually uh, merge upstream in in a controlled fashion. Uh, well, are you talking about, excuse me, are you talking about doing those in the, on the client side or the server side? Yes. Both. Okay. Um, so I'm working, I would, if I, I haven't started this, but if I did, I would be on the server side and we'd have to, I'd have to work with someone on the, on the, on the client side and there we have the, we have the inability to, uh, Partly due to COVID-19, uh, the inability to, to have testing events. So uh, I'm not sure what to do about that. The one thing I think we should be thinking about is maybe working with uh, sort of, uh, with protocols other than infinite that don't require ever everybody to be that can be tested on the internet. But I'm not sure. We happen to have an RDMA protocol that operates over the internet. It's an IETF standard and it exists in several industry implementations. But you're right, it, the, uh, the inability to have a face-to-face -face does impact RDMA, which is typically deployed, you know, at 50 meters or less. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's important to note that the Linux implementation supports, <coughs> excuse me, supports Rocky, InfiniBand and IWARP. Um, I believe it's the only NFS of RDMA implementation in the industry that does all three. Um, the limitation of testing events is typically because um, our colleagues have implementations that don't support two out of three of those. So I think uh, Solaris okay. supports only InfiniBand, and I believe NetApp only supports Rocky at this point. So there is Rocky V2 right now, from at least two or three Rocky vendors that uses a UDP encapsulation. It tends to fall apart under load on long haul networks, but it does work. So that is a second alternative. Plus, if you are, uh, if you are well, face to face, uh, how are we using laptops, right? So. I don't uh, with, uh, with Linux. I was going to say with with Linux, um, we certainly can use soft iWarp now um, on a laptop. Uh, okay. There's also soft Rocky, uh, which is pretty poor. What, but is, what is the standard apps of the soft iWarp? Is that is that in in good shape? Because we have a uh, soft iWarp on on our side, and that would be a good that'd be good. To, Try to try interoperability at, at distance. So, Olga, um, your colleague Olga Korniskaya at NetApp did the Linux soft IWARP testing for NFS over RDMA, and she confirms that the stack works for uh, NFS, at least for light loads. Well, I'll talk um, to her about that. Yeah. yeah. The status of soft IWARP in Linux is that it is upstream, so it's in a standard kernel as of about six months ago, I think. And I mean, actively maintained, uh, most, most people report that it functions well. It interoperates with hardware implementations. Yes. So, uh, you know, pretty good, I would say. Yeah, um, it was, uh, that was uh, actually something that I had been uh, driving the RDMA, the Linux RDMA community to adopt um, simply because this, uh, this testing issue has been uh, uh, present for, since we've started NFS over RDMA testing at these events. Um, and I think soft IWARP is something that everybody can get around, uh, except maybe Solaris, um, just because they don't seem to have the uh, 
developer uh, resources to implement that right at the moment. What about Rocky V2 is also uh, software only? Or is it uh, we, as Linux can do uh, a soft Rocky V2. Rocky V2 has hardware implementations from a number of vendors. Yeah, I know, of course, but I'm, I'm thinking about testing because if I'm talking about uh, NVMe over fabric, uh, it is important for me. Because I, we, we want to support all the protocols. Okay. Okay. Did uh, Soren? Did I answer your question adequately? Yes. 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 I, I was not aware about all because I was not involved. In, I I'm mostly looking at I work for, from Chelsea. Always. That's what we have. So, and that's uh, the the one that is probably. Uh, May support maintaining Linux. You know, so I didn't uh, think about the software only, but it's good for to know because if I want, we want any interrupt, um, I won't have a server in my laptop or a Chelsea card. So. Right. I would just add that you know, for operation over the internet, I would strongly recommend an iWarp based solution. The TCP protocol is far superior at dealing with. Yeah, that's my 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 planning actually for you see to uh, next time it's mostly to focus on that but you know for interop is good indeed okay um let me stand down from this presentation with uh addressing the last bullet um we do have a milestone for the, the two documents i mentioned at the beginning of this presentation uh, but we don't have I don't believe a plan for working group last call. Um, I'm wondering if we could get something sketched in a little bit. I mean, nothing that I, you know, is hard and fast. Well, things, normally, but... no way we deal with this is the author or the editor, and you're the editor, and figures out when he wants to do that. I think you, from what from the presentation, there aren't that many open issues. I think. We should have some discussion, and then you should decide when you think think WGLC is appropriate. Yeah, I think we need some reviews also, so. right? Something old. I will review. I will. I offer myself. To review. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, it's a little premature to have a last call. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not asking no. for a last call. I'm just yeah. sort of. Trying to get a sense of what what are the P's and Q's that have to be dotted and crossed before or we get there. What do we, you know, it's just a just a sort of an abstract conversation. You provided a list of open issues. If you, I don't know of any other ones, so maybe that's it. Okay. All right. So another maybe one or two revisions of this document, and then we can ask the same question: What's the plan for WGLC? Sure. All right. Fair enough. I mean, last call is not the goal, right? Consensus is the goal. So, you know, try to try to drum some up. Okay, we'll do. Okay, uh, I guess I'm the next slot too. Is that right? Yes, you are. Okay, um, this will probably be quick. I don't have any slides for this one. Um, Essentially, I was uh, hoping to ask for any further comments or concerns about the RPC TLS document. Um, the uh, AD review is quite vigorous. Um, I think the document is in much better shape than it was before going to AD review. So um, now is the opportunity for anyone to speak up and and uh, you know make any comments. Uh could we, Mrs. Magnus, can we quickly discuss this CID things for DTLS? Uh, I sent a reply to this, but uh, you maybe haven't read it because I did it during the meeting so far. Um, I, I think there's one aspect of this usage of the connection IDs TLS, which is, I mean, it, it does incur overhead. And that's my question to the working group is, is more, is it useful to use it from that perspective or will it cause issues? And maybe my understanding of, of 
how NFS or etc. how you would use this in with RPC in many cases, but I would expect that you have a server port which at least has a, some number of simultaneous connection and, and connection ID space needs to be big enough to encompass the whole expected maximum number of simultaneous connections. If you do a flat one. So if I could offer a little context really an expert with uh, DTLS, but first of all, um, RPC on UDP is generally for um, operation with very uh, quick um, single or a handful of requests, um, RPC bind, or it's used for um, operation with a uh, lot like the NFS lock manager where the, the all of the requests are small. And so I think Anyone who's adopting to use DTLS will probably be doing so and wish for as low overhead as possible. And so maybe that should be a design constraint. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean the the aspect of this is that you're if you're having this, I mean, that you actually leave the correction state in place and 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 <laughs> have this and you occasionally do these very short requests. I don't know how many simultaneous users across the state is it, it becomes the question but uh, i don't think the overhead is massive it's probably i mean four bytes would give you four million billion uh, uh mm -hmm. so it's what i think is neat i think it's need an example uh, implementation example implementation i think because i don't know how important this is i read all the, the discussions and i complexity that we don't know if it will be useful so uh, to share so i, I yeah. don't know so maybe the easiest way is not to say anything more than that this exists and i don't think it's 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 you can either use the connection id or not i mean basically with dtls 1.3 it seems to be an, yeah, an existing part of it it's like it's going to be up to the server when it negotiate if it's going to use it or not so Yeah, my intention with DTLS is just to put a stake in the sand, and obviously, as as we get implementations, there will there will be future um, documents uh, cleaning up the mess that I've made. I'm not expecting this to be the last word. Okay, any more comments? No, not for me. So, Chuck, do you try to write, address that last issue a little bit text or then publish them and submit the draft? Yes, uh, my intention is to uh, merge in your comments from today in email and um, uh, submit uh, a new revision by the end of the week. Okay, good. So my plan then is to actually rather soon go to ITF last call and the working group can use the ITF last call time to verify these last changes. Okay. If you have any more changes, I think, but you can review the changes so far. Okay, good. Okay, I'm up next. So I so let me see if any let me uh, get something up. Uh, let's see. Uh, Which of the end of us? I'm going to be. Uh, can can people see my screen now? Or are they still seeing Chuck's Chuck's screen? All right. Yes, I'm now the presenter. Okay. So I'm going to, these were really originally three separate or then See four separate talks, but I just merged into one because they're all related to the same thing, which is documents related to RFC 5661 bit. We don't see anything. I don't, I don't see any Give slides. me a second. Give me a second. There's, hold on, try this. It keeps it keeps telling me that I'm the presenter, but I don't. But if anyone, that's There's fine two. for me. But 
There's two logins for NFSB4 Working Group, which I assume is you. You have to share your screen, Dave. You are the presenter okay, because I, you're the person let me, who's let me speaking. See how to do that? I think I have done that. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think I, we don't know. Right, uh, okay. There are two NGs, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's how I gave it to both. I don't know, it doesn't give me, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, it's a different NG, okay, all right. Oh. You want me to give it to the other one? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was the one at the bottom. Okay. Try again as I'm passing the baton. Try again, Dave. Doesn't give me a way to do it. Okay, oh, here it is. Share contact, okay, right, screen one, okay. There we go. Ta-da! Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. All right, so let me go ahead and... All right. Now we we've gotten to the point where RFC fifty six six one is not right; that it is contradicted by later RFCs in many, many areas. First of all, the version approach is pre eighty one seventy seventy eight. It's wrong and confusing. The confusion that uh, uh, Tom addressed in RFC eighty four thirty four is not clarified, and we have now pending some ch substantial changes in RFC 5661, but we still need a single document explaining, defining NFSB 4.1. And uh, also, the internationalization section is based on string prep with no connection to actual in implementation. So it's really kind of a mess now. Everyone knows what's valid in it, what's not valid in it, but to a neophyte, he tries to read it, and he some of some of it applies, and some of it doesn't. And I think we really need to correct that that problem. The big issue is the treatment of security. Uh, really needs the updating revision. Revision. There's no thread analysis. Uh, the the vague secure goal of uh, supporting use on the internet. And uh, lack of attention to monitoring threats and use of authors in the clear with no authentication of client is treated as optional. Actually, the word optional is not is used in RFC 7930, but the word optional is not used in 5660 wood. It does say may implement. So now that we have RPC TLS that that that, that Chuck and Trond has provided for us, we have the ability to improve things without changing the v4.1 protocol. Also, we have an accumulation of errata reports, including some that were officially rejected for reasons that, that, that we can go into. Given that they have changes, substantial changes to the RFC 5661, the, RFC, the working group, group has agreed to it, but these changes are not documented anywhere except on the working group list. There's some emails that Tron pointed me to where we all agreed that something had to change, but it was never changed, and therefore RFC 5661 is kind of out of date. So that's why we need to take this on, even though it's a lot of work. Well, given that I said that, I, th I think this can be done. A lot of people saying, oh, having trouble with that, but uh, lots of stuff is already done. Many changes are already documented pretty well in existing RFCs. In other cases, the working group has made clear decisions that need to be explained. We have reasonable treatment of internationalization in RFC 7530, and RPC TLS could be the basis for a reasonable security approach. So I think we need to come to terms with, with what I perceive to be our, our, our post-7530 trauma. I, it was very long and very onerous, Thing and we finally got done, and 
I think at some time, at a time after that, we were thinking of, well, gee, maybe we won't do this again. Maybe we'll somehow do small documents. That won't work. So I, I concluded, even though that effort was a drag, we need to consider where it would be now if we had not done it. And the working group needs to work together to address these issues. I think I'll present a reasonable plan, and this plan is about how we do it. And we have to, part of it has to be a serious review effort for submission. There's too many places where we just so say, think, oh, we wear hands and we don't want to deal with some of the th parts of the spec that aren't clear. And we do just make sure that we're going forward with a clear spec. All right, now the, all right, let's see. Uh, well, I, I believe there's multiple, because we have two areas that were the same in V4.0 and V4.1, we have to have multiple documents. One is internationalization, will be the same in 4.0 and 4.1, and we need a new document just to describe internationalization in NFSC4 as a whole. And security is in bad shape for, for all minor versions, and it makes sense to provide an NFSC4 wide treatment. Now, in addition to those two, before wide documents, we need a, uh, a revised V4.1 spec. We'll based on the RFC resulting someday from draft IETF NFC4 RFC 5661 SESQUI MSNS. That will read, reference to those two documents and it'll have a bunch of other changes. Okay, let's go over to. Internationalization is far as far as long. I have actually IDs, and uh, I think they're okay. But we need some working group review before adoption, before they're adopted as working group documents. But that's far as long. Security, which I'll spend most of the time, the time in this talk on, needs to address the existing weaknesses, which apply to all minor versions, and uh, those will be based on. Uh, the uh, the work that Chuck talked about with draft ITF NFV4 RPC TLS. That'll be of critical import, importance in providing a basis to do this. Now, I am expect to produce an informational ID uh, about our options and choices in, 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 in the security area. And I expect that to be adopted as an internal working group document. Often we had, we've had information informational IDs, and then we go through this process of thinking about pr producing this information IFC. There's no point. I think in this case, it's best for us to just make the decision now, adopt it as an in, in, internal document, and go on with that. And have the working group work together to improve that. And once we have that nailed down, then go on to the standard, to, to produce the standards track document. Then we have to address RFC 56 bis broad. We'll start with limited ID. We'll use the RFC resulting from the SESCU process. And we'll start, I'll start and address the limits of well understood issues within that framework. These things that we're talking about the, uh, is, are the, the versioning issue, uh, referencing the security, new security and uh, and um, an internationalizing document. And then one, then we'll be in position to adopt that as a working group document. And then I would ask some help, I need some help from Tom about addressing RFC 8434 and PNFS clarification. And there, there are, I'll talk later about some working progress. And then we'll need a major review effort before submission, so that is, that is a ways out, at least a year. Anyway, do, do people have any questions about that introduction session about going forward with RFC 5661 BIS? Yeah, I'm. Oh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I was wondering about why we would include PNFS in the BIS document rather than having that also separated into a, a different document? 
What what were you thinking? I didn't hear. Well, we're breaking out security and internationalization. Um, I'm wondering if PNFS should be in a separate document, and we've we've already gotten some RFCs in this area. Why why do you think it needs to be organized so that the PNFS uh, stuff in that's in 5661 needs to continue to be in 5661 BIS? Well, PNFS is a uh, is within is the 5661 feature. I don't see any reason to change that. <clears throat> Making the document smaller and easier to review would be a reason to change it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think actually one other aspect of this, which you haven't brought up, is actually to take the outcoming RFC, see, okay, what kind of boundaries inside? Can you actually just chop this document up into a couple of pieces, which makes it rather than this 700 page monster, this into something at least a little bit more more manageable. Yes, it's results in such reference maybe across the doc between documents, but it might make everyone's life easier, especially if, if there's any future updates in the future that would need it. Okay, well, if someone has a, uh, that's an idea, but if someone has a concrete plan to do that, uh, we'll consider it. But right now, I don't know. Because I think some of the cases, for example, Split out PNFS. Well, it makes the document easier easier to review, but I'm not sure that <clears throat> that's a good thing. It makes the it may make the document clearly easier to review, but just by hey. ignoring all the PNFS cases, you don't have to review those. But Dave, David, we'll have to but, deal with them. Dave, but there is a differentiator because we have other PNFS 5662 and so on, so it makes sense to the PNFS out, so make the basic document smaller. I mean, it's possible, I don't know that you like it, but it, it's not I, against the... I, I have a, just a history here. Uh, so yes, sir, we had separate PNFS documents for optional pieces of PNFS, I thought, historically. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, I agree. On no, that's, 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 don't say yay, yeah, because that, that's my worry, Magnus. Magnus, the, the single document part was the absolute required part of NFS. The separate documents historically have been either the other protocols or optional layout mechanisms that were not required for um, compatible well, for compliance with the protocol. So yeah, but that's um, it's not difficult to fix. I mean, I, you can it say does in, require in a, a little. It does require a discussion before pulling the trigger. Yeah, no, but it's it's. I think I mean you could basically take that all the mandatory parts, even if you put them in in four different documents. The main entry document can say to implement the whole of NFS 4.1, you need to implement the following references and this document. Yes, two things. Reviewers would have to understand that nothing moves forward unless all moves forward. And as Dave said, putting cutting the pizza into four pieces doesn't actually mean it's still it's going to be easier to eat than the whole pizza. It may be convenient, <laughs> perhaps, but it doesn't make it easier. Like in the no, end, no. you're still eating a whole pizza. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of sense, you're eating the whole pizza, but uh, there are certain steps in the process where uh, for example, at least the RFC editor, et cetera, they can actually assign potentially four different editors to that document if there's four different pieces. Uh, but yeah, that's yes. Yeah, that, can we put this as yeah, an AI I don't think... to the list for me and Dave? To, uh, I, 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 I think it's, I think it's to me, I'm okay with it, but we, this has been discussed in the ancient mist of the past and we, I think that was before we realized we have a 700 page document. Dave was yes. there, Alan so. was there, so. so my point Maybe was- uh, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put an AI to take to the list. BP, my point was that it's not an impossibility. I didn't say we should do it. We, of yeah. course, we should discuss it, that's all I'm saying. Not that I, I'm not a big fan of that, but I thought that if there are precedents, okay, if it's gonna result in a smaller document, maybe. Because we all suffer from it, we know that. So, 
I, I would let's let me restate saying I think you should think about this document structure is for how you make this process as easy as possible for you to complete with as little effort as possible. Uh, then it's good if the, like the ISG etc actually can check. I mean that's actually one point of keeping the document together is that if you can actually diff it in a reasonable way. You can ignore all of the section that hasn't changed, etc., <laughs> which makes some of the reviews for a lot of people much easier that already has looked at it. Say, okay, okay, but... okay. I'll, I, I will. I'll, I'll take this to the list. I'll work with Dave on it to get this worded correctly for what the proposal is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So let's go on nothing. to the internationalization section. Wait, Dave. I have a comment. Um, so you, you said several times, or you mentioned several times, NFS before over TLS, and I want to repeat what the Tom Haynes said earlier today, that we tend to create a spec, then do implementation, then find out that the implementation is impossible, and then we modify the spec. So now, what is the rationale to put this NFS over, over, uh, over TLS? To into spec if there's no implementation which uses it or provides it. I think there are implementations. Yes. Okay. I, I think the Linux client I know for sure has it. I suspect the server does. And um, I, I know my product uses it too. Our server supports it, but I, I didn't see this in the current Linux client. It's not in Linux at all, but it is in FreeBSD. So it's, I mean, it, it has to be written down somewhere for multiple implementations to attempt to implement. The, the ITF process normally will publish a draft spec and will allow implementations to proceed. And if they prove the spec and you know, there's no further changes. Well, it gets published as a final version. So, I mean, we maybe maybe our process is a little bit ahead of itself by saying, we're gonna write it all down and call it done, and last call and we're done and hooray, and all of a sudden we realize, oops, right? Well, the ITF in theory shouldn't work that way. The other problem we had, Tom, was when you have a big 700 page document, you can't implement it all. Right. And it can't be reviewed. Magnus has a good point on that. I think, you know, in addition, the reader can't consume the damn thing, right? So breaking it up makes really good sense to me in a lot of ways. But, you know, it, it's like I, I would not worry about writing down a draft protocol. That's the whole point of writing it down. Everybody agrees on it and gets it to the point where they start to implement it. If we've already reached that point, well, then we'd better write it down and get started on something better than, you know, an, a personal internet draft, kind of, right? It, it's carts and horses, that's all. I mean, one, one, that one point about this related to the security solution, you need a security solution that stands up to modern scrutiny. That's that's going to be a requirement. This document is not going to be published without reaching that goal. And I think so if that's TLS or if it's something else, that's that's up to you to decide. But you need to have something which fulfills modern security expectations when it comes to security. Yeah, because I, I think like a third of my attempts to get a document published is to get it past security, knowing that it's not modern. All right, from a time point of view, I think I have to go ahead with internationalization. As, 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 as Brian has said, he'll figure, he'll figure out how, how the working group address this divided up issue. I think from a time point of view, the appropriate time to do is when we consider making the BIS document 
a working group document. Let's go on. Okay. Internationalization, that's farthest along. So the, the original thing that I thought of doing, about doing was just propagate the internationalization that's in RFC 7530. That seemed very nice. We have NFC4A.O implementation did not match RFC 3530, uh, but did match RFC 7530. It turns out the G4.1 implementation did the same thing. But RFC 5661 was written matching RFC 3530, which we had this string prep based thing, and uh, no implementations match it. No international changes was made in 4.1 or 4.2. Or, or the internationalization was always the same in the implementation and had various implementations in, uh, in specs. So I thought, well, one could just apply the whole internationalization of RFC 7530 to RFC V4 as a whole. And that was the approach I took in the dash, in the dash zero, zero ID. Then I found out there's a problem. Uh, that was handed in the international internalized uh, domain domain names, and so when I found that, I took the RFC, what was in RFC 7530, which was valid to confirm conform to IDNA was was that it was a 2003. Now many of the things that in in the documents the server are supposed to do, including those that says should do, which I can't. Are, are an obsolete document, and there's no way I can produce a new document that says do those things. So IDNIT allows these to go through, but I don't think it's appropriate for a new document, even if the ISG would accept it, which is a kind of doubt. So I need to revise the, the international domain handling, match that for 2008, and while warning of the possible compatibility issues, well, I really don't think exists, but theoretically could exist. So that's the dash 01. Now, that's where we are with, with internationalization. So we need to pass going forward, and I, I need people to review the latest ID, but I have some trouble doing that because a lot of people don't want to or are not able to uh, uh, review uh, internationalization. So I think we may need to find out how to get input from internationalization experts outside the working group, and I don't know how to do that, but that, that's a necessary thing that we should do. Also, we need input from implementers about how existing implementations of V4 deal with the international, internalized, nationalized domain name issues, if they do at all. I'm looking to get to a working group document, but I'm not sure how many iterations will be will be required. I need to pick a milestone, and I've picked December of the, at the end of this year, and I think that should be safe enough for the nationalization part. Now, as uh, As uh, as Magnus noticed, this is essential. And uh, although I hadn't put it together, I think he's right that you know if we don't address this, it's we're not going to we're not no one's going to publish this. So we have a series of in the current document we have we have a series of documentation problems and we have some substantive problems. The documentation problem is. There is no thread analysis. I'm not sure how RFC 5661 was was approved without a thread. Supposedly they're all supposed to have them, but we don't have one. And the goal is secure use on the internet. Now it's not made clear if that has been in the document whether it's been realized. And here's the spoiler alert: it hasn't been. Now there's. A couple of major substantive problems from implementation. 
is lack of encryption use. There is a provision for encryption, but almost nobody ever does it. And the extensive use of auth sys in the clear without authentication of the client. And therefore, you have the possibility that anybody can simply say, here's a request under auth sys, and the server has no choice, has no real choice but to uh, execute it. Now, first, I'll look at the problem with presentation. There's no thread analysis, which is required by BCP 72. Uh, well, it's not clear how the various uh, NFAs for RFCs got, got through without. 3530 probably was, was, was done before RFC, before BCP 72, but 5661 and 7530, I don't know how they slipped by. Now, the problem is, yes, that's a requirement, but really, it's not clear what a security consideration section should say without a threat analysis. In RFCs 7530 and 5661, just to be a, a series of security-related observations. And, well, yes, but it doesn't really tell you what kind of security you have, or it's the way, or someone can confuse that security isn't very good. Uh, so without threat analysis, you don't know what secure use on the internet means. And if there's security choices, what is the effect of making such choices? For example, the, the use of security of auth sys is true is optional. Uh, it says it, it, 56 is what the server may implement. The other problem that we have is enforcement privacy is up to the server. Cost is mentioned as a reason not to do it, but there's no attention to the corresponding sequence consequences, which is basically that all your data can be seen or modified by pretty much anybody. And so the question arises, the normal security considerations say, what are the security consequences of these issues? But the document doesn't really deal with it and just currently seems to assume they're not important. And that's a problem that we we have had again and again that you know, people just assume that security is important, but we have we can we have to change that. Okay. Now the first substantive security problem we have is lack of encryption use. Privacy is treated in the specs as an expensive add-on. Well, as defined, it is expensive. Here. I think we just lost Dave. His microphone logo disappeared. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, he's talking, but he doesn't know we can't hear him. Yeah, so send a note. <laughs> We've lost your audio. I can hear you, but you're not on WebEx. I'm, I just called you from my real phone. I don't know how you managed to do that, but you're not on WebEx. Your, your slides are viewing, but your but your sound is done. Can reconnect audio somehow? His phone dropped off. Yeah, I thought, yeah, your phone dropped off. All right, I think he's trying to reconnect.
really love that video feedback we get from his screen when he does this. I don't know. I wish I could figure out how to do that. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. On a post. There we have a phone. Okay. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. Okay, now I find out how to uh, get my get my get my share my screen again. Let's see. Mm hmm. We are seeing your screen, so. <laughs> you seen it? Yeah, just yeah because uh, you're sharing your whole desktop, I think. And so if you only just move to your. Okay, fine. Uh, let's, let's go for Bring okay. up the presentation so you again. You can see it now? There we go. Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. So now I'm on, uh, I'm on slide 17. So officially, according to the documents, um, Auth is a, a means of, of authentication, although usable weak. It's efficiently optional, but it's really not possible to ship a server which doesn't support it because almost, almost nobody would use it. So without authentication of the client, the client's authentication of the user cannot be trusted. So the reality here is that AuthSys is an effectively mandatory to implement means of non-authentication which is optional for attackers to use, unfortunately. So that situation needs to change, and the in interesting question is how to change it. Now, we're, despite that problem, we're kind of lucky in that uh, Chuck and Tron have provided RPC TLS to be a good basis for them. So now that we have this, we have to get we have possibilities for change. One might be getting rid of it, I'm sure that people in the security, I've heard from the security director, they would love to do that. But it really, I, I think, I think we can think about it a little bit and find out that it's really not really possible. It's possible to deprecate in some way, saying should not, but it doesn't prevent people from using it. And I think that probably is why the reason we still have it is you not, we can't get people to stop using it. The war, you give, in the, give people warning, say this is dumb, but it probably will not be effective. So we could try to provide some way to reduce the problems. So we have to select well, at least one of those. We may need to deprecate this as well as doing some op op some operations to mitigate. We may mainly choose to mitigate the problems and then deprecate the unapproved version, for example. But my understanding is that as long as you actually have transport security between the end post and the host providing the uh, authorization to or trying to make a statement about their its its source identity or source authentication it's it's probably fine as long as you have the mandatory to use transport security uh, for a lot of cases maybe not fully in well, this you don't case need, i don't know just be you you need to Okay, once you have the, if you have, uh, you have encryption with a self-signed certificate, you have, you, you, you can't have anyone else in, interfere, but you do need to have, and RPC TLS does provide, although it doesn't, it, 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 uh, it doesn't put the, put the emphasis on it, but an important part of it is giving some sort of authentication so that you know who is trying to contact you, who's who's saying, "Gee, I'm a client, and I can give you these these UIDs and GIDs, 
And without that, I don't think you you haven't perfect, gone very far. It's, you need more than authentication, although it is provided by RPC TLS. So, uh, so you need to specify, we, we have the facilities in RPC TLS, but as we've discussed, we need appropriate policies for RPC TLS use by a V4, for encryption and for client authentication. And there are a number of decisions that need to be made. And I'll try to go over those, although I only have 11 minutes left. Yeah, maybe yes, one clarification on my point here is that in an environment where you moved off from having any unsecured, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, statement about your identity from the client side, and the server and the client can trust that it's talking to the intended server. In that environment, you might not require client device or client authentic hard cli encrypt uh, client authentication because the password, etc., or similar secrets might be sufficient. Because now you moved okay. from an environment yeah. where it was possible to easily snoop them to an environment where they really should be secrets. Well, right. Okay. Point. So, uh, but that's, that's you true. might have additional but requirements think, in the when environment. When we speak of client here. authentication, we mean two things. Yeah. I think typically RPC, uh, sorry, RPC, SEC RPC GSS provides authentication of the client user. But the authentication we're talking about that's provided by RPC LS is authentication of the client host. And those, that's, when I say client authentication here, it's authentication of the client host. Yeah. Um, I, I assume this is going to be a substantial discussion in the end. Uh, and the, the threat analysis is going to go into this also, I think, explain why certain aspects of it's needed or not in different deployments. I, I know it's, we expect to be controversial, but we'll have to work on that, yes. I, not that it's controversial, uh, I think it requires discussion that you go through it all, so. Uh. Okay. All right, so here this slide uh, presents what I believe to be the framework we need for a new approach. It's based on a threat analysis. We need to deal with two major security issues, the lack of encryption and the execution of another thing, both of which has been partially addressed, the framework has been provided by RPC TLS. And we'll, I think we'll use the RPC TLS with additional requirements that are NSA before specific. And they're, in making these changes to do this, there's some complicated factors to do. So the general ones are deal with the next slide. So, well, you know, often we talk about, well, we need to change the requirements. You know, we, we, uh, we, we said, uh, we said oh, this is optional and we need to change it so it should not. But I don't think we can do that. Because first of all, you, when you create new requirements for new facilities, like, gee, you have to use RPC TLS is, well, maybe someone hasn't done it yet. And you can't really say you're required to do something that you can't do. And we need to address we may need to adjust ill-advised requirements like OSIS being optional. But we need to do that with care because some changes might not be followed immediately or at all. You can say you did, must do things, but you can't make people do it. And when you make changes in existing uh, requirements or recommendations, you can create interoperabilities because a client written to the old spec exists and you have one written to the new one and it might not be able to interoperate. So I think we have about seven minutes left level. I think I just have to don't have to go over this in all in, in in detail. But we need to decide what our threat analysis goals are. Uh, one of the goals is secure use on the internet. And it's been assumed by a lot of people that in the typical uh, 
networks we work on with with incumbent net networks. We don't need that level. We pretty much need that level of security because, you know, if you uh, are not working in an environment essentially where everyone has the same password, that you want to protect user A from seeing user B's file. And the fact that they work for the same company does not do that. And I think we can stop assuming that somehow the fact that we're on an isolated network means that we don't need to deal with security. I disagree with that. We have specific policies about when you can, when you require to use encryption. And I think most people would say you always should use encryption. Uh, RPC TLS is a, encryption is a good good fit, but uh, but there are other forms of encryption that either w are provided or will be provided. One is is encryption. Encryption in the RPC over RDMA adapters often provide encryption, which you don't see. And I think that needs to be allowed. And also probably eventually we'll have TLS equivalent such as quick. So we need to formulate or requirement that you have an authentication, but needs to be, uh, hey, you have encryption, but needs to be sufficiently flexible so that uh, you'll, okay. Get to that one because uh, we're getting, getting kind of late. Well, again, we have the problem which was that it's a valid choice, but uh, I'm not sure we can just say should not, but we have to give some indication of what the problem is. And if you do that, I don't care about a, a, a term being in all capital letters, but if you do this, what you expose yourself to. That's our obligation in Brighton State. Mm -hmm. All right. This is client authentication, which we need. But I, by that, I mean uh, authentication of the client host. And we have an issue about where that, where that description appears. I've been thinking it be in the V4 security document, but it could appear as a correction to RC 5531 since there is, is an extensive but not very clear description of auth sys in Appendix A to RC 5531. So, all right. Another issue that we have is, is V4 one specific thing is of state and session protection. We have SP we have SP4 none, which is most people have implemented, but there's no protection about that. And you're exposed basically that someone could just if you don't have encryption, certainly, you can uh someone can get your session ID and he can make a use he can issue requests whether you know use your slot IDs and make you so that you whenever you have a request, it'll have the wrong sequence ID. And he doesn't even have to have he doesn't even have to have a high value value uh user to do it, he can just any user. And uh without that protection you're exposed to the knobs. So that's something we have to address. Now, if you do have client authentication, I believe, and I think Chuck mentioned this once, you can avoid the need for SP4 MAC cred. And certainly, we I don't know if we delete this from the spec, but SP4 SSV has never been implemented. And I think with client, client host authentication, I don't think you need it. Uh, so in any case, that's where we are. Now, uh, it's getting late. Now, some of this is to be superseded by, by the remark that, remarks that Magnus made about maybe splitting this document up. But I think if we do that, the appropriate time to do that would be when I've done the work 
to that I anticipated in the 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 uh, the personal ID, and we 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 make a decision of what the the way to go forward is with the with the standards track document. So anyway, I think that that's done, and it's almost three o'clock. So that's it for me. Questions? Questions, anybody? Hey, uh, so, so there's been questions about the slides. Dave, if you have all the slides, you'll post to the data tracker. Um, if you haven't sent slides I to don't Dave, know how to do that. Them, please. You what? Okay, I have, I have, I have, uh, okay. I have uh, all of uh, uh, the slides from, uh, from Chuck. And I don't know how to post the dead tracker. Uh, okay. So I, think, uh, I think send them to me. Send them to me. I'll take care of it. Okay. Then I'll, I'll okay that'd be it. great. And, hey, um, uh, every, okay. Everybody Terrific. online, by the way, there I I have repeatedly sent out the link to the Etherpad notes. Um, I don't have all of your uh, all of your company affiliations. Segrin, I'm sorry. Who are you from? I'm kind of spy here, so I'm from Daisy. Got it. Spy International. Got it. Um, from Germany. Haynes, so. Haynes, Haynes, you're at where? Net up these days? Oh, uh, Hammerspace. Hammerspace. I knew that. And uh, Palpy. Microsoft. Microsoft in there. Yep, I knew that. I see myself. Microsoft, please. Got it. And then uh, Jorge. Uh, is he still on? Jorge uh, Mora was on. Anybody know? NetApp. NetApp. Okay. I'm going to change the name of the working group soon. Uh, Joey Salazar. I thought he put his name down. Oh, he did. Never mind. Got it. He was there twice. I have a process question before we ring off. Um, is the agenda for next week posted yet and the log the dial-in logistics, et cetera? Well, I think I, I think I sent a, uh, I'll send that out in any case with the, I sent out an, an agenda, but it's not a final. I'll send that out tonight. Yeah, please. I look for it on the mailing list in order to mention it to some folks who might not be on the mailing list, uh, I, you know, in, Whatever. I, there's nothing I can forward to anybody. So that'd be great. So Tom, I, I have a, it's in my calendar at least. So something is sent. Yeah. All right. Dave, calendar. Huh. Okay. Dave, I'm going to resend the invite for the WebEx. It was, um, it was way back in my, uh, in my mail queue. So I'll, I'll resend to the V4 group. Okay. And you, and you get the agenda. <clears throat> Well, I, yeah, I'll oh, get the was, agenda. I'll send out the invitation with the agenda tonight. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, this is Mark Boschke. Uh With regards to the authentication of the host client versus the uh, user on the host client, um, that is one of the things that sort of needs to be addressed somehow in future documents because it is becoming a problem where we've got uh, group permissions are not necessarily enough. There are actually some access control lists that it would be desirable to be reflected um, that are per user and so being able to authenticate as the given user that's privilege to look at the files is a highly desirable. Well, we have that now. I mean, that's uh, how ACLs work. Yeah, I know, ACL. But I'm saying that if you're using, uh, you're using weak authentication and that the client can lie. If you, if you can own the client, uh, the, ho the, the client host, then you can basically masquerade as anybody. Right, that's the problem. Yeah, and I'm just saying that it would be an interesting or and or desirable 
if there's two kinds of authentication being carried in the requests, that, that someone nece might necessarily want to authenticate to the host client separately and then carry that authentication through to the servers. Right now, in, with the RPC SEC GSS, you have just the, uh, the client user authentication. Uh, and I think that works, but a lot of people don't want to use it, and we're, we have to provide some ability to have, I think, what we had with OSYS, but in, this, in, a, in a more secure way. That's what I've been thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it wasn't clear when I was reading the documents that that's what's going on. So I guess some kind of clarification about how <clears throat> that actually works would be highly desirable. Okay, sure. That was all my only comment, so thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. It was a good, uh, interesting meeting. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Dave, you need to declare meeting over? I, de uh, I hereby declare the meeting over. All right. See everybody next week. Thank you. Thank you.